So I've never met anyone who wanted to be less decisive, but I have met many people who feel like they would benefit from being able to make decisions better and faster. And that's what we're going to look at in this video. I've got a bunch of slides here and we're going to be diving into why decisiveness is so important, why it's so hard and what we can do about it. Some tools, strategies and mental models for improving our ability to be decisive. Now, quick mention that I'm building a course called Smart Action that helps people become more action oriented, become more decisive, become more productive. Uh, there's a waiting list for that at the moment. You can check that out in the link below or you can go to joinsmartaction.com. So we're going to dive in. And uh, by the way, if you see me starting to sweat, it's not because I'm nervous. It's because this room has no air conditioning. It's about 30 two degrees celsius which i think is like 90 fahrenheit today it is warm and i've got a hot coffee uh, that i'm drinking so i am absolutely roasting but we're going to get this done so the decisive person gets things done they learn quickly because they fail fast they operate with high agency shaping the world to their desires rather than reacting to everything the decisive person knows that the only true way to get better at making decisions is to make them. That mental models and decision-making tools are helpful only so far as they are used. The decisive person reduces the time between thought and action. They violently squash the temptation to delay and, do, and to deliberate. And the decisive person is by definition an action-oriented person. A decision is a commitment and the commitment entails action. You cannot be decisive and be a non-action taker at the same time. And when we think of people who are decisive, we think of them also as action takers. Finally, the decisive person has better judgment than the non-decisive person. They've iterated many times, they've seen it before, they've spent time in the territory itself, not just looking at the map. They know what it looks like to be in the arena, to be doing the work. They know what actually works and what doesn't. If that's not enough proof as to why you should be more decisive, then let's look at a few more points. One of the main things is that you fail faster, you learn faster, and you succeed faster. You experience this sort of compounding effect that benefits from speed. And in a moment, we're going to look at the decision cycle, which will give you a visual to kind of understand how this works. Second, as you make decisions commit and get results you build momentum and confidence you think back to a time in your life and maybe you're in one right now where you were achieving things you were doing work you were making decisions and you felt this you felt this kind of sense that you were just winning in everything that you did it was like a momentum extremely powerful you'd wake up each day excited to do the work to achieve hard things uh, to embrace challenges and decisions were a lot easier for you and so one of the benefits to being decisive is that you experience this more often whereas the indecisive person doesn't right they find it hard to build momentum they might not have any at all and they lack confidence third it increases your luck surface area this is something that i've talked about before in other videos but you can see luck surface area as like your potential for luck or your potential for serendipity an example the person who puts out 100 YouTube videos has a larger luck surface area than the person who doesn't put out any. The person who publishes things, who does the work, who makes the decisions, increases their potential for serendipitous things to happen. Perhaps someone watches one of your videos and emails you with a business opportunity or a job or something like that. But if you're not putting things out into the world or you're not making decisions or you're not getting out there, then your luck surface area is minimized perhaps the best reason is that you just feel better when you're in a state of indecision especially for a long time it can feel like a personal hell you don't feel good you feel kind of useless you're not moving you're not taking action uh, it's not fun and it's it's no way to live and so being decisive it just makes for a better life in my opinion All right so we know that being decisive is important you probably knew that before you even started this video that's why you clicked on it why is it hard? Why is it so hard to be decisive? First of all, we have the paradox of choice. The paradox of choice is 
popularized by Barry Schwartz, who wrote a book called The Paradox of Choice. And it's all about the fact that in our modern world, choices, options have exploded. In the past, say 100 years ago, if you wanted to buy a pair of jeans, you only had like one or two options. Like you'd go to the local jean maker in the town and that's what you would get. Today, you can go to a shopping mall and there's like 20 different shops. And inside those shops, there's like 20 different styles and brands of jeans. And so it's like things have just exploded. Same goes for uh, opportunities, like job opportunities. In the past, 100 years ago, if you wanted to start a business or take a certain job, there might have been a dozen options available to you, whereas today there's hundreds, if not thousands. Okay, so choices, the choices that we are faced with, the options that we are faced with have increased in quantity and complexity, and that makes it hard. As a result, we we get these two types of people. We get maximizers and satisficers. Barry Swartz talks about maximizers as those who seek and accept only the best. So they're always trying to find the optimal choice, the optimal outcome. They're going to buy some jeans and they'll spend three hours in the mall trying to find the perfect pair, whereas a satisficer settles for good enough. And in fact, you should want, you should aim to be more of a satisficer because what the maximizer suffers from is indecision. First of all, if you're spending three hours trying to find a pair of jeans, you know, that's like costing you time. Secondly, he states that maximizers actually end up more dissatisfied with their decision. Because they've spent so long trying to make it, they are more likely to experience regret, whereas a satisficer who settles for good enough doesn't. The second reason being decisive is hard is due to mimetic desire and external influence. It's not just that we have a hundred different career path options today, it's that we're being told certain ones are better than others and we're attracted to certain aspects of some paths or some decisions that we might make without seeing the full picture. And so we suffer from mimetic desire, which Gerard talks about, which we want to mimic other human beings. Uh, and often that means that we mimic them in a way that is not really authentic to ourselves. So we look at the investment banker and we think, I want to do that. But really we're attracted to the prestige, uh, the status, but not the actual work itself. And so this makes decision making a lot more complex because it's harder to get down to really drill down to the authentic desires that you have. Third, indecision inertia. When you haven't made a decision in a while, or you're consistently deliberating and avoiding making decisions, then it's a lot easier to stay there than it is to escape. A lot of this comes from just the desire to remain in the comfort zone, the strong forces biochemically and psychologically that want you to stay in homeostasis. When you make a decision, that implies that you're going to take some action and taking action can often be uncomfortable. So there's a lot of pressure to not make a decision, to remain in indecision. So we call it indecision inertia. We have this irrational desire for certainty too. It's irrational because if you were to make a decision with complete certainty, then it wouldn't be a decision, you would have made it, right? If you were 100% certain about something, it's just not a decision. If you're like, I'm 100% certain that I'm going to watch uh, this on Netflix tonight. It's like, well, you've made a decision at that point. If you're 100% certain, there's no debate, right? Once you recognize that every decision involves some uncertainty, then you stop trying to seek perfect 100% certainty and you start thinking in bets, as Annie Duke would say. She's got a great book called Thinking in Bets, uh, where it's like every decision you make is, is basically a bet and you're betting on probabilities, the same way you would in poker. You might think this has an 80% chance of success, but you're recognizing that the outcome could be the 20% that's not the outcome you want. Fifth is a misjudgment of significance. We often take decisions that are not that important or not that significant and we blow them up uh, into heightened significance in our minds and we delay making those decisions because we think it's more important than it is. We're going to look at that in a moment when we look at the three levels of decisions, but all that's to say, some decisions are not worth deliberating on. Some decisions are kind of inconsequential. Uh, others are not, right? But the indecisive person misjudges the significance of decisions and they take hours to make decisions that should be made in minutes or weeks to make decisions that should be made in hours and so forth. 
Finally, we have a lack of courage, which probably doesn't need more explaining, but we're going to look at that later in this video. So in my mind, there are three levels of decisions. We have level one decisions, which have minor consequences over short time frames. For example, which type of coffee should I order? What should I watch on Netflix tonight? These are things that it just doesn't really matter at the end of the day. If you order, you know, a, a black coffee or one with milk, um, whatever. Should I watch this show on Netflix? Should I not? It just doesn't matter. However, it is worth pointing out that some of these level one decisions can become habits, good and bad. So for example, you might say, should I watch Netflix or should I read a book? Well, it's like if you do that on the odd night, once a week, like it doesn't matter. But if you start doing that every night and you're choosing to watch Netflix, that becomes a habit. You could be ready to book that might be more productive or what have you. Uh, and so that's just a caveat there. Level two decisions, level two decisions have notable consequences over medium time frames. Okay, so things like which project should I work on this month? Or should I take on extra client work right now? Where do I want to go on vacation? Should I even go on vacation? These are things that have more significant consequences. And so they're worth thinking through a little bit sometimes. If you take on extra project work that you don't really have time for, then you might get burned up. That's significant. If you go to a certain place on vacation, but you haven't thought a third and you're like, actually, I hate lying on the beach in Greece. That sounds horrible. I don't know why it would, but you know, if you just rush to the first place that looks interesting, then you might not like it. And the third level of decisions is significant consequences over long time frames. This is where we often get stuck. Uh, decisions like, should I quit my job to start a business? Should I marry this person? Should I buy a house? These are decisions that we can't really rush into. Uh, they take a lot of sort of pondering, thinking, meditating on. And again, it's often where we get stuck. Okay, let's look at the decision cycle. When faced with a decision, we start with options. Let's use an example. Let's say you have a business and you're thinking about launching a new product and it's either you do that or you improve an existing product. And your goal is to create more revenue, right? So you might have goal above this options box here, which kind of dictates the options available. Now from options, we go to evaluation. You've got these two options in front of you and you're starting to evaluate them. Like what's the best option? What should I pick? What are the pros? What are the cons? So on and so forth. At some point, you stop this evaluation process and you make a decision. This is a commitment. A decision is a commitment. From decision follows action. So maybe we decide I'm going to launch a new product. That's a decision I've made to the uh, the other one is, is moved aside. We can't work on both. And so we start taking the action. Maybe we start developing the product. Maybe we uh, survey the email list to, to figure out what that product might be. So on and so forth. We take an action. After action, we get outcome. So we take an action. Maybe it's that we survey our audience and we find out which type of product we should build. And we get an outcome. We get the survey results back. Now what happens is it goes all the way back to the start where we get more options, which we'll get to in a second. But there's something I must mention, which is that you can make a good decision and get an unwanted outcome. If you're running a business, you might decide I need to hire someone. And you look at a list of candidates and you work through them all. Maybe you've got a short list of five. You interview them and then you decide on one that seems like a good fit. Six months later, it turns out they're not a good fit. Did you make the wrong decision? No, you made the right decision, given the information at the time, the best decision you could have made, the outcome just happened to be part of that probability that wasn't ideal, that was the unwanted outcome. That's why you want to think in terms of bets and probabilities. You want to say to yourself, I'm going to hire this person. I think there's an 80% chance they're a good fit, but there's obviously that 20% chance they might not be, and that could happen and I'm okay with that, I'm gonna move forward anyway. So you get the outcome and then you move back all the way back to options. So you've decided to launch a new product, you're taking an action which is to survey the audience you have and that's led to an outcome which is the results. So you get the results back and you move back to options. Which is, this is kind of like a sub cycle in the decision action outcome, right? 
So the new options are, well, a lot of people want this kind of product and a lot of people want this kind of product. Maybe it's like 50-50 or something. And so now you, now you have to evaluate that. Like, do we do this product or do we design this product? And so you move through this again and you go to the decision and you decide I'm going to do this product. You take the action, which is to further validate and so on and so on and so forth. When we talk about becoming more decisive, what we're really talking about is this evaluation piece. And there's a number of things that influence the evaluation process, the decision-making process. The first is state. How are you mentally, emotionally, physically? If you're tired, you're exhausted, you're in a bad mood, that's going to affect your decision making. If you're feeling confident, you've got momentum, you're energized, you're well rested, that's also going to affect your decision making. Beliefs. What do we believe about the situation we're in? What do we believe about ourselves? What do we believe about the world? Also going to affect our decision making. If we believe that launching a new product is a lot harder than improving an existing one, then that's going to influence the decision we make, the evaluation process. We have values which play their part in the evaluation process. Values influence decision making in the sense that some decisions we will uh, completely ignore or we'll say, no, that doesn't fit my values or it's unethical or something like that. And so we push that aside or it's not in our evaluation box. Desires. What do we want? If we want an easy life, then we're going to make certain decisions. If in the context of business, launching a new product or improving an existing one, if our desire is to maximize our money, our personal income or profit for a short time frame, say three to six months, then maybe it might be improving the existing product. If our desire is to build a long-term business over five years, then maybe launching the, the new product might be better. Then we have models, so mental models, theory and experience. So what do you understand about cognitive biases uh, and what have you experienced in the past that influences the way you're making the decision? A good example is sunk cost fallacy. If you don't know what sunk cost fallacy is, uh, then you're less likely to include it in your evaluation process. And so again, in the context of launching new product versus existing, you might think, well, I spent so much time making this product, I should try and improve it more and more and more. And it's like, well, that could just be the fact, that could just be some cost fallacy. And you need to like incorporate that in your evaluation process because it's irrational to just make a decision based on how much time you've already spent on something. Experience is obviously important as well. If you've faced a similar decision before, you can kind of map on uh, certain aspects of that decision. You see this in the hiring process in business. Um, people who have hired a lot of employees start to develop an intuitive sense of who might be a good fit and who might not. They can't necessarily explain it, explain why someone's not a good fit, but they just know. And finally, we have framing, which is similar to beliefs, but it's how are you framing the decision? How are you looking at it? Uh, I talked about this in my last video called The Power of Reframing. So if you want to learn more about that, then I would check that video out. Now, this is, uh, this is complex. There's a lot more to this. I talk about it in Smart Action. We go deep on the evaluation layer. We spend a lot more time on it uh, because it is really uh, the core of decision making and all these things, all these six things influence how you make decisions. Again, if you're making level one decisions and a lot of level two decisions, all this stuff, you don't really need to worry about too much, but uh, level three decisions and some more significant level two decisions, it does come in handy. So we have four pillars of decisiveness. This is what I'm calling the four pillars of decisiveness. Courage, agency and belief, momentum and speed and energy. Hope you like my uh, little diagrams. They're not quite aligned, but it's all right. The first pillar is courage. There's two quotes that I want to share. The first one, brilliant thinking is rare, but courage is an even shorter supply. And then mental clarity is the child of courage, not the other way around. We often think that if we just get clarity, if we just think through something enough, then we'll build the courage to make the decision. But in fact, it's often the opposite. The courage comes first, the clarity comes afterward. We often use lack of information as an excuse to hide a lack of courage. So we're faced with a decision and we know that if we make that decision, we're making a commitment to something that's challenging, perhaps involves some risk and perhaps we're a little bit fearful of. The antidote to that is courage, but the story we tell ourselves is that we lack the data or we lack 
the information and so we can't make the decision yet. We need to gain some more clarity. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes we do lack information and we need to go and find more. But quite often we're kidding ourselves and what we need to do is muster up the courage to then go and commit and to make that decision in the face of uncertainty. The opposite of courage is fear, like disabling fear. Much of that fear comes from how we frame decisions and frame situations. If we can frame decisions as worthwhile challenges that will make us better, then we can increase our courage, right? There's too much fear, or it seems like there's too much risk, and it can be harder to build up the courage to face it than if it were less. So if we go back to that example, improve or launch a new product, improve an existing one, we might be too scared to make either decision because we think, well, what if we break the business? right and if you're framing it that way then it can be kind of tricky but if you're framing it in a way where it's like neither of these are going to break the business because of x y and z or we can only go up from here then it's a lot easier to build up the courage to make the decision second pillar is agency and belief so high agency people are decisive people they view the world as malleable they make things happen they aren't debilitated by others' opinions or their own. A low agency person accepts the story that is given to them. High agency is the sense that the story given to you by other people about what you can and cannot do is just that, a story. And you have control over the story. It's a quote from George Mack, which I love. Not only does agency make you more decisive, it expands the decisions available to you. Low agency people tend to stick to the tried and true methods where high agency people look for the third way. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're looking for a job. What do most people do? They send in their resume, they have a cover letter, and they just kind of like send it to a bunch of companies. Well, that's what everybody does. The high agency, the high agency person might look for the third way. And so they might say, I'm going to target five companies that I really want to work for. And I'm going to look at their business, analyze their business and write up a two or three page report on how I think they could improve certain things. And I'm just going to email it to the CEO and see what they think. And I'll say, hey, if you, I, I did this analysis. I think this could help. I'm happy to implement it. Uh, otherwise, just keep it. Use it anyway, right? And it's like, people don't think that they can do those kind of things, but they can. You're allowed to. No, no one's stopping you. It's not illegal. The third pillar is Momentum. When you're making a decision in a state of momentum, it's like slicing through butter with a warm knife. It just happens. It just becomes so much easier. You've got all this momentum in one direction and the decisions are just like, you know, it's like, uh, what's that game? It's like a certain game where you're like a fish and as you get bigger, you can eat up the smaller fish and so on and so on and so forth. That's what it's like. It's like you're getting bigger. There's all these little fish and you're just like chomping them down right? Decisions, decisions, boom, 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 boom. That's what happens when you have momentum. Conversely, when you're stuck in inertia, when you're still, when you have no momentum, then making the simplest of decisions can feel impossible, right? And so momentum is so important. To develop it, you must move from that evaluation layer of the decision cycle that we looked at. You must move from the evaluation to the action layer as quickly as possible. And once you're in that cycle, once you're making those decisions and you're getting the outcomes, whether good or bad, then you're building some momentum. You can navigate it better once inside. This is why people say a decision is better than no decision because it takes you from non-action into action. And once you're here, then you have the potential for momentum. But over here, you, you don't. You just can't build momentum without taking the first step, without moving something, without being in motion. When you have momentum, it is crucial that you maintain decisiveness. Indecision kills momentum faster than anything else. And you probably know this for yourself. I'm sure you've experienced it before where you have momentum and then a challenge comes up and you slow down a bit and you think about it, but you think about it for a bit too long and then you've lost it. Like you've lost the momentum and it's very hard to get back. The fourth pillar is energy and state. We kind of covered this with the evaluation layer before in the decision cycle, but if you're in a low energy state, then decisions are not only more difficult to make, but you're also more likely to make poor decisions. Low energy states cloud your judgment and thinking, and they also make it harder to positively frame situations. 
I talked about this in my last video on, on framing where I was talking about how I have this big commitment for the year, a big project that I'm working on. And in the end of 2023, when I'd committed to it, I was in a high energy state. I felt really good about it. It was the right decision. And then the first couple of weeks of this year, I was a bit sleep deprived. And I remember waking up one day and thinking, ah, you know, what am I doing? Like, why, why have I committed to such a project? Like, this is stupid. And just the, the self-doubt, you know, started entering in. And it wasn't until a few hours later that I realized that I was in a low energy state. I was in a bad state. It was affecting my ability to think, pushed it aside, woke up the next day well rested. And those sort of feelings had, they hadn't gone, but they'd minimized significantly. There's, there's also an inextricable link between momentum and energy and state. Like if you've got momentum and then you have a series of nights where you're extremely sleep deprived and you end up like getting exhausted, then there's a pretty significant chance that your momentum subsides. With this said, this is an important caveat. You shouldn't use state and energy as a crutch or a cope. Uh, I saw someone on X on Twitter a while back saying that they couldn't do or they couldn't pursue this big goal or challenging thing they wanted to do uh, because they needed to get their energy optimized first. And it's not like they were sick or anything. It's not like they were in a really bad state. They just thought that they needed to like <laughs> get perfectly optimized before they could pursue the thing. And I was like, this is absurd. That's, you know, that's a cope. Like it's a story you're telling yourself that you won't be able to do this unless you're like perfectly optimized, you're perf getting the perfect amount of sleep, eating perfectly. No, no, no. You want to be able to maintain momentum and motivation even if you wake up one day and you're exhausted and tired. You want to be able to maintain the ability to make decisions, the ability to do work even if you're in that low energy state. But that doesn't mean you should purposely go out and do things that lower your state. Like if I drink alcohol before an important day where I know I'm going to need to make decisions or like work hard, that's not a good idea. It's going to affect my ability to operate that day. So I don't do it, at least most of the time, not perfect. So you should aim to maintain a high energy state because it makes everything else better, not just in terms of decisiveness, but just quality of life. All right, so let's end this video with some tools for improving decisiveness. First, we have the luck razor. I got this idea from George Mack. Uh, he basically says that if you're faced with two or more decisions or two or more choices, then choose the path that increases luck. An example, small example. It's Wednesday night and you haven't got any plans for the evening. You're a little bit tired. And a friend texts you and says, hey, uh, a friend of mine is in town. He runs this business or he does this thing. Um, thought you might be interested in meeting him. And so now you're faced with the decision. Do you stay in, watch Netflix, which is kind of what you want to do, you know, like, uh, like had a long day, whatever. Or do you go and meet this guy? And so you're struggling with that decision. Which one increases your luck? It's of course, it's meeting the person, right? Watching Netflix is not going to increase your luck. I'm not saying that you need to always do things that you don't really want to do. Like there's nothing wrong with watching Netflix, guys, right? Seriously. The other night I watched Foundation with uh, with my wife. It was great. It's cool to just like sit down and do nothing. Um, but when you can't decide, choose the option that increases luck. Another tool is to be committed but flexible. A lot of people are afraid of commitment because they think that that's it. Like in their minds, subconsciously and irrationally, they think if I make this decision, that's what I have to do forever, which is obviously not true. And if you take a step back, you know it's not true. But in the moment, it feels like it, right? And so being committed but flexible is to commit fully until you find a better alternative, if you find a better alternative that you can switch to. Because when you're in a state of commitment, then you can build the momentum. But when you're, not, when you're not in a state of commitment, when you haven't committed to anything, it's very hard to do that. Another one which we've kind of covered is just to reframe. How can you reframe the decision that you need to make so that it's easier to make? And so perhaps you're faced with the decision to, should I increase my work hours at my job? Or 
do I pick up a hobby? It's very easy to say to yourself something like, well, the hobby won't produce money and it would be nice to have more money uh, and so on and so on and so on. But it's like, that's not the exact truth. The hobby might lead to something else. It might lead to a side hustle, which produces far more income than you could ever imagine. So you need to frame situations differently, like play around with them, manipulate them, think of the benefits above the benefits, think of the consequences that aren't just first order, but second order, positive and negative. Uh, decision reduction. This is a big one. It's reducing the size of the commitment that you have to make. So perhaps you're wanting to build a business, but when you think of building a business, it's like five-year commitment, and that's daunting. Don't think of it that way. Again, reframe it, reduce it. Just take it down to how can I validate a product idea and see if it works. Just start there, like that's the only thing you need to do. Maybe you want to move cities. That's a big move. Go there for two weeks. The decision you need to make, it's like, do I go there for two weeks just to see what it's like? Just to get some more data. Now, the 40, 70 year old. So I forgot who this was by. Um, I think it was some uh, military general or something like that. He says, with 40% of the information, you're likely to make a poor decision. Like, you need a certain amount of information. Right? You can't just make every decision blindly. But if you've got more than 70%, then you've taken too long. And for me, the point where I start getting diminishing returns on research or thinking, or it's like I start feeling myself going around in circles, usually that's a sign that I've taken a bit too long and I need to just make the decision. Uh, hard is usually right. We have so many biases and things that just push us towards choosing the easy option, like subconsciously, consciously, everything. And so the harder choice is usually the right one right, for like 80% of decisions. So it's a good sort of heuristic where it's like, you're faced with two decisions, one seems more challenging than the other. Uh, the challenging one is, is probably the right one to take. Not always, but probably. Remember, we can't get to absolute certainty. So we're always taking some sort of risk on. Inversion. Think about the worst decision you could make and then invert it. So maybe you're thinking about which city to move to and you're really not sure what you want out of it. Uh, well, think of the worst possible city that you can move to, like the worst characteristics, what would you hate, and then just invert it. It's often easier to think about the negative than the positive. And then one-way versus two-way doors. Jeff Bezos talked about this uh, on the podcast with Lex Friedman, where he's like, most decisions are two-way doors, and people don't realize it. So you can go through the door, and you can come back the other way. You can start a side hustle, do it for six months, realize it's not for you, and you can come back out. Yes, you do lose some things. You lose time, so on and so on and so on, but you also gain things like skills, knowledge, experience, and what have you. Other decisions are one-way doors. You have a kid, like that's a one-way door. You can't put it back in, right? <laughs> it's there. So when faced with a decision, consider that. Is this a two-way door or a one-way door? Most of the time, it's gonna be a two-way door, and you should consider the fact that you can always go back and exit. Out the same way you came in. Finally, second order thinking. Uh, this is important for level two and level three decisions. What are the consequences beyond the consequences? No decision is made in a vacuum. If you decide to do something, it's going to have an immediate outcome and it's going to have other outcomes. Let's look at some questions. These are some good questions to ask yourself to journal over when you're faced with a big decision. Uh, and they're useful reframes to, to use. So, what makes me the better human? What decision, what option makes me the better human being? Again, usually it's gonna be the more challenging path, right? What do I get by not being able to decide? What's stopping me from making a decision right now? Like really drill down on it. Is it that you're confused? Is it that you don't have enough information? Is it that you need to talk to someone? Is it that you lack courage? Identify what it is, it might be more than one thing, and then work on eliminating it. Is this a decision that needs to be made or simply a distraction? Often things come up when we're doing our work or something like that, and we think that we need to make a decision on it, but really we can actually just put it aside, deem it as unnecessary or unimportant. Have I created a false dichotomy? Is there a third better option? For example, let's go back to that original example of launching a new product versus improving the existing product with the goal of creating more revenue. Well, actually, it might be that we don't need to do either of those, but we need to improve 
the marketing channel or one of the marketing channels in the business. And that is in fact the best path to increasing top line revenue, all right? So always think of the third way. Is there a third way? Is there a better option that I'm not considering? Am I trying to find certainty where it will never exist? This is a huge one. Certainty is not going to exist with most decisions. So if you're trying to find it, then you're gonna be disappointed. Good reminder. And then finally, am I optimizing for the short term or for the long term? When you're making a decision, there's gonna be short term consequences, maybe benefits um, and long term consequences and maybe not benefits, maybe things that aren't so good. So again, in business, it's like decision. Do I hustle, grind and try and make a lot of money in the next three months and email my audience a lot and launch a bunch of products and do this and do this and do this? What the long-term consequences of that might be lower revenue. It might be that you alienate a lot of your audience or you burn yourself out, you lack energy, um, you get jaded. You know, you have to consider these things over long time frames and short time frames. That is it for this video. We've covered a bunch of stuff. We've looked at why being decisive is important, why it's hard to make decisions. We looked at the decision cycle, that diagram that I showed you. Uh, we looked at the four pillars of decisiveness and then some tools and some questions that we can use to help ourselves make decisions. Like I said, this is a complex topic. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said about it. There's a lot more practical things you can do to get better. And for that, check out the course I'm building, Smart Action. Uh, again, link below, or we'll just go to that URL. There's a waitlist at the moment. You can join that waitlist and you'll get notified when it goes live. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.